appropriate for pathology for USMLE step one. The topic for this section is head and neck pathology. We're going to begin by looking at pathology that specifically affects the oral cavity. Perhaps one of the most common manifestations of pathology within the uh, oral cavity is infection with a herpes simplex virus that leads to the very commonplace cold sore. Can also lead in other individuals to an acute herpetic gingiva stomatocytis. The pathology within the, what one sees if one examines a cold sore is uh, grossly vesicles or large bullet filled with a clear serous fluid. These will rupture and produce painful red-rimmed ulcerations. Microscopically, if one were to examine the um, fluid that comes out of these vesicles, or for some reason to biopsy uh, this area, what one would see is cells affected with the particular eosinophilic intranuclear viral inclusions that characterize herpes infection that can often be outlined with using a particular smear known as the Zank smear. Now, there are other various um, sores that one can develop around the mouth and oral region, including the canker sore, or as they are more specifically referred to in medicine, an aphthous ulcer. An aphthous ulcer merely refers to a shallow, hyperemic ulceration, often covered by a thin layer of exudate and rimmed by an uh, area of erythema. If one were to take a biopsy of this region, what one would see is a mononuclear inflammatory infiltrate in the surrounding region, hence a collection probably of plasma cells and monocytes. These uh, lesions will often spontaneously resolve without any therapy. One other lesion that you can see, an infectious inflammatory lesion of the oral cavity, is candidiasis or thrush. This is characterized when one looks in the oropharynx of a white inflammatory membrane, which is composed of a uh, matted collection of organisms surrounded by a fibrinosuppurative exudate. One of the uh, notable features about thrush is that unlike other conditions that affect with a white exudate in the mouth, such as leukoplakia, in thrush, this white mass of organisms and fibrinosuppurative exudate can be very easily scraped off. It leaves an erythematous, reddened area underlying it, and you should think about thrush in individuals who are for some reason immunocompromised. So if you remember back to our lecture on the immunodeficiencies, you might think about this in people who have systemic disorders such as diabetes or HIV, or who for some reason perhaps have been immunocompromised to treat either a, um, a collagen vascular disease or who've undergone some sort of organ transplantation. Also think about thrush developing patients who are on long-term uh, antibacterial therapy and thus have had a change within the normal flora that makes up the uh, organisms in the mouth. The picture in this slide simply shows what we uh, deem an aphthous ulcer, here pointed out by the arrow on the tongue in this individual. That covers the inflammatory and infectious lesions that one will see within the oral cavity and leaves us with our other major topic, which are tumors and precancerous lesions of the oral cavity. Here, the main thing that one will want to always center on is, first of all, what are your patient's risk factors, particularly the use of tobacco or heavy alcohol use, and then also look for various precancerous lesions that you may see in individuals that should be noted as being possible uh, pre-malignant states to the most common form of cancer that one will see within the oral cavity, which is squamous cell carcinoma. Now, our precancerous or premalignant conditions that we need to be concerned about in the oral cavity are leukoplakia and erythroplakia. As the names imply, these present differently in terms of both their coloration and the risk of malignancy that follows. Leukoplakia, as the name leuko implies, is a white plaque on the oral mucosus membranes that, in contrast to something such as thrush, cannot be removed easily by scraping. It cannot be classified clinically or microscopically as another disease entity and is considered precancerous. Erythroplakia, again, as the name implies, is a red, velvety, sometimes eroded area within the oral cavity that usually is level or perhaps slightly depressed in relation to the surrounding mucosa. There is a higher risk of malignant transformation with erythroplakia than there is with leukoplakia. This slide simply shows an example of leukoplakia. Seen here, we're looking up at the hard palate of an affected individual. These started as a series of discrete lesions that could not be readily escaped from the hard palate of the mouth, and now that have become a confluent mass 
of uh, white matted material firmly adherent to the roof of the mouth. Now, risk factors to the development of leukoplakia, erythroplakia, and tumors such as squamous cell cancer of the mouth, the big risk factors are going to be alcohol and tobacco. But any patient who has chronic exposure within the oral cavity to persistent irritants is going to be at increased risk for developing oral cancer. Thus, one also wants to think about patients, for example, who have ill-fitting dentures. Or, always remember the great scourge of our uh, teenage athletes chewing tobacco. It's also begun to be recognized that HPV-16, often and uh, known for its role in squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix, also appears to be playing a role in the development of squamous cell cancer elsewhere in the body, including here in the oral cavity. Again, for leukoplakia and erythroplakia and for squamous cell tumors, one can see either solitary or multiple lesions in the oral cavity that may have either indistinct or well-demarcated borders. Before we move on to dealing with frank malignant tumors within the oral cavity, it's worth mentioning hairy leukoplakia. You will see this most often in the setting of patients who are infected with HIV. The causative organism is the Epstein-Barr virus, EBV. Here, again, the clinical presentation can be confused with leukoplakia or oral candidiasis, where what one has on the oral mucosa are white, confluent patches of fluffy, hyperkeratotic thickening of the surrounding epithelia. When one looks histologically at biopsies from these lesions, you see piling up of keratotic squamous cells that overlie areas of mucosal acanthosis. This brings us to the major tumor that exists within the uh, oral cavity, squamous cell carcinoma. The primary area that's going to be affected by most cases of squamous cell carcinoma is going to be the tongue. Hence, this will always be one area you will want to examine carefully in uh, your patients during the physical exam, particularly those who have a long history of tobacco and or alcohol use. The pathology tends to be areas of raised, firm, sometimes pearly appearing plaques. It can also be areas of irregular roughening or somewhat verrucous, that is papillary appearing areas of uh, mucosal thickening. The squamous cell cancer of the oral cavity likes to spread to the surrounding lymph nodes and then down to the lungs, liver, and eventually to the bones. Now for the nose and upper airways. Again, we're going to deal first with uh, inflammation and infections that affect the nose and upper airway. Of course, here we're all familiar with the common cold, or as we term it in medicine, infectious rhinitis. Causes here are generally viral and range from a variety of organisms, including adenovirus, echovirus, rhinovirus, mainly depending upon the season and where one happens to be in the country in terms of what you're going to be exposed to. For those of uh, you who either have had a cold or had to examine a patient with a cold, the physical findings are classic. The thickened demodus red nasal mucosa with the nasal cavities being narrowed and the turbinites being enlarged. For those of you unfortunate enough to suffer from allergic rhinitis or hay fever, you're aware of this IgE-mediated immune reaction with both an early and a late phase response. Here the clinical uh, picture is characterized again by extensive mucosal edema, redness, and often copious mucus secretion. Histologically, what one sees is a neutrophilic leukocytic uh, infiltration of the surrounding tissue with a um, uh, predominant uh, eosinophilic population present as well. For people who undergo con, uh, continued infections of the nasal mucosa, they can lead to the development of nasal polyps. Um, what uh, you see is a focal protrusion of the mucosa, which when one looks at it histologically appears very edematous, with a very loose stroma, uh, with hyperplastic or cystic mucus glands infiltrated by various inflammatory cells. The uh, predominant sequelae that one is concerned about with the development of the nasal polyp is that they can become ulcerated and lead to secondary infections in these patients. Sinusitis, as the name implies, is simply impairment of drainage of a sinus secondary to things such as inflammatory edema of the mucosa. Um, this can lead to the impounding of separative exudates producing empyema of the sinus. One thing to remember here with sinusitis is that depending upon your population, distinct infectious organisms may be present. And the most uh, common of uh, these you'll need to worry about is when one is dealing with the diabetic population, you want to be concerned that they have developed a mucor sinusitis and ask your pathologist to look for these organisms if they are looking at um, a biopsy or material removed from an infected sinus.
Necrotizing lesions of the nose and upper airways, we have already mentioned mucormycosis, which one will see in diabetics. Wegener's granulomatosis can affect this area, as can the lethal midline granuloma. The latter is actually a form of lymphoma that used to be universally fatal, but with its recognition as a lymphoma, now can be very successfully treated with various forms of chemotherapy. Now to the nasopharynx. Um, we all have probably encountered in our youth uh, cases of pharyngitis and tonsillitis. Again, here, as with rhinitis and sinusitis, the causes can be many and varied. We often uh, are worried about a viral etiology for this. Rhinovirus, acrovirus, again, can play a role, as can adenovirus. Uh, RSV, respiratory syncytial virus, is also an etiologic agent here, as is influenza. Obviously, and when it comes to bacteria, our big players are going to be things such as beta hemolytic strep and staph aureus. Uh, clinically, the picture, unfortunately, is often going to be the same, leaving the clinician and concerned parent guessing as to whether uh, antibiotic therapy is needed or not. You will see inflamed nasopharyngeal mucosa covered by, often by an exudative membrane, tonsils which will be enlarged and covered by exudates. One does need to make the differentiation between whether one is dealing with a streptococcal form of pharyngitis and tonsillitis versus a viral form, as the former is more prone, if untreated, to various post-streptococcal complications, including the development of rheumatic fever and glomerulonephritis. Tumors here within the nasopharynx. Um, a particular form that is common within adolescent males is a nasopharyngeal angiofibroma. As the name, name angio implies, these are highly vascular tumors which can be removed successfully with, in surgery, but with, which often bleed excessively while they're being removed, presenting quite a challenge to the surgical team that's involved. Inverted papillomas, as the name implies, are papillomas that rather than growing outward, uh, grow inward and are a uh, proliferation of squamous epithelium, which given that they're growing inward can affect other surrounding structures such as the orbit or cranium. The isolated plasma cytoma, as the name implies, is a tumor that arises from lymphoid structures in the nasopharynx. They present as polypoid growths surrounded by the overlying mucosa. And the important thing to remember, as the name isolated implies, will rarely progress on to the more malignant tumor associated with plasma cells, multiple myeloma. There's a small round blue cell tumor associated with the nasopharynx, and this is the olfactory neuroblastoma. The olfactory neuroblastoma can present either as a low-grade or as a more high-grade, highly malignant tumor composed of, not surprisingly, small round blue cells that look like neuroblasts and look like other small round blue cells in the tumor, such as the peripheral neuroblastoma or the primitive neuroectodermal tumors of the brain, such as the central uh, neuroblastoma or the medulloblastoma that one will see within the cerebellum and posterior fossa. This tumor arises, the olfactory neuroblastoma, from neuroendocrine cells or the olfactory mucosa, and hence will stain with our various immunohistochemical markers for neuroendocrine cells, such as synaptophysin. Now, nasopharyngeal carcinoma tends to most uh, frequently be a squamous cell carcinoma that can present in a variety of different patterns. It can present as a keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma or a non-keratinizing squamous cell carcinoma. It can also take on a very undifferentiated appearance with an intense lymphocytic infiltrate. Risk factors for this are hereditary, so one must be aware of family history, and infection with EBV. The tragedy of nasopharyngeal carcinoma is that they tend to grow silently and quietly until they reach the point where they're unresectable and the patient has very few uh, surgical or other therapeutic options available to them. That finishes this first section of the Falcon Pathology Review for USMLE Step 1 on the uh, uh, no